great insights. I'll tell a, just a quick story about Sadaputta. One of his, my favorite articles of his essays is called God and the Laws of Physics. Now, part of mechanistic science says we don't need God. We'll discuss this a little later about mechanistic in the introduction. We don't need anything else. This describes everything. So Sadaputta thought deeply. Can God and the laws of physics coexist? In other words, could God even interfere or make things happen and still observe the laws of physics? And he used chaos theory. Chaos theory is such that if a butterfly hits a little dust whirlwind in Africa, that will impact, and this has been modeled, will a hurricane uh, hit uh, New Orleans, who deserves it, or Florida, who, who really doesn't deserve it at all. You know, which will it hit? And 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 so that was, uh, and and the this was discovered accidentally, where a computer programmer was programming hurricane and wind forecasts, and he said, "Well, we're going out twenty significant figures. We can't even measure that far. So let's only go out to what we can measure." And it turns out. It made a huge difference. In other words, below what we can measure, below what we can measure can make a difference. Things that are inconceivable to measure. So it didn't prove anything, this paper. It just gave, as Sadaputu would often do, a concept that makes sense that's worth exploring. So I invited Sadaputu to give a lecture at the College of Worcester in Ohio when I was living there. And um, the chairman of the department flew him in, gave him an honorarium, it was very nicely done. And he said to the students at the very beginning of Sadaputu's lecture, now remember our rules. And he said to the faculty, the students ask questions first. No faculty can ask a question until the students are done. We're an undergraduate institution, we want the students engaged. So Sadaputu gave his lecture. And when the lecture was done, this was a chairman of the religion department, which almost always is an atheist. And so the, he, he, that's actually true. And, 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 and so he jumped up out of his chair and said, what about this? What about that? Ignored his rule, sort of peppering him with questions because he couldn't tolerate that his worldview was being shattered. That was Sadaputa's unique ability. Um, oh, that was a great, when he jumped up, I, I was ear to ear grinning because I, I knew what was gonna happen. So um, uh, our uh, next speaker is Badri Narayan Swami, who's very, he, Sadaputta spent a decade or so in San Diego and um, Badri Narayan Swami was temple president and he became governing board commissioner. And he spent a lot of time and worked with him and really in the core of his heart appreciated Sadaputu's intellectual contribution, and they got along very, very well. Um, and uh, Badrin Ryan still serving very actively as a GBC man, and um, uh, even though he has serious health problems, he still his mood is I'm going to die on the battlefield, and uh, he, he's quite courageous that way. So he's going to give a short talk on his experiences with Sadaputu. Roll it, Chris. Hare Krishna. This is Badri Narayan Swami, San Diego, California. And I'm remembering my friend and hero, Sadaputta Prabhu. He was here in San Diego for several years in the early 80s. And as soon as I met him, as soon as anyone met him, they could understand that this is a gentleman. This is a gentle, refined, sophisticated person. He spoke with his clipped academic accent. He had a biting sense of humor. I'll give you an example. A, we, he and I were going to a home program, a program to somebody's house, and uh, the devotee who picked us up had a brand new SU Mercedes. SUV. And, you know, he's a nice devotee, no issue, but he was quite proud of it. And he was showing it off to Sadaputta, who, you know, was very renounced and on a whole d 
different level. But oh, it goes from zero to 60 to this and that, and it can do this and this and that, and has so many mag wheels, and then Sadabruta being the gentleman that he was, said, oh, very nice, very nice. So we get in the car, and it was when these OnStar or voice, at, you know, instruction first started happening. So there's brand new uh, phenomena. And this was a woman's voice. So uh, we get in, and everybody's, you know, getting ready to take off in the car, and the voice says, a, a door is ajar. A door is ajar. Sadaputta says, no. A door is always a door, and a jar is always a jar. Anyway, we move forward, and this recorded voice is saying, uh, slow down, slow down, speed up, speed up, turn left, turn left, turn right, go this way, go that, badgering, you know, on and on and on. And Sadaputta, after about 15 minutes of this, said to the driver, hey, this is worse than being married. I mean, we're not picking on marriage, don't go the wrong way, but it was a very, it was Sadaputta's accurate analysis and a way of gently bringing the devotee, he was paying to be harassed, you know, and, and this is modern technology, or, you know, whatever it is, harsh Ashoka, it brings some happiness and it brings an equal amount of distress. So Sadaputta in his own gentlemanly way was pointing this out. He was absorbed in his service of presenting a scientific view of the Vedic understanding. I remember he was a genuine scholar. He was a, a transcendental, I want to say geek, but it really doesn't do him justice because he wasn't awkward at all. He was, he was a, a real gentleman. But I remember there was a PhD candidate who uh, was helping him with some research work. And Sadaput had been traveling and uh, they met in the front hall of the San Diego Temple. Uh, they'd both been, you know, they'd been out of touch for some time. And uh, I was walking out of the temple, and Sadaputta was walking in. He had one shoe on, one shoe off. He was taking his shoes off to go into the temple. One shoe on, one shoe up. The PhD candidate was coming out of the temple um, and saw Sadaputta in the, in the temple front hall, and he was, had been in the process of putting his shoes on when Sadaputta came in. So he also had one shoe on, one shoe off, because they were caught in the process of coming and going. And they locked into a conversation and just sailed off far beyond my pedestrian plane. And I came back, I swear to you, I came back an hour and a half later. They were still in the front hall, locked in a conversation, each of them with one shoe on and one shoe off. They just time froze and they were off, you know, on the, and the, whatever the externals were, were completely irrelevant. I remember, we have a program uh, once a week at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, one of the better hard science schools in America. And we had a program on Friday, a dinner, with some bhajan, some kirtan, a little kata, a little talk, and a dinner. And one evening, by Krishna's grace, Sadaputta was the speaker that evening, so he was with us. And uh, there's probably around 40 students, something like that, five or six devotees. And this professor came. And evidently what had happened is some of his post-grad students had come to him and said, oh, we went to this Hare Krishna program and there was a speaker there and he made a whole lot of sense. And the professor, obviously, this well, you're just sentimentalist, and how could these people possibly, you know, just the opiate of the people and sentiment and blind faith, you know, all their concepts. So he came that particular evening uh, with a few of those students, and his, his intent was to just reveal the pedestrian nature of this, you know, uh, and sentimental nature of this, Hare Krishna speaker and save his students from the uh, romantic illusion they'd fallen into and bring them back to hard science. That was his intent. And by Krishna's grace, as I said, Sadaputta was the speaker. So he said, when it came time to questions and answers, he said, well, you say this and this and this, but this and this and this research proves this. Sadaputta, in a calm gentlemanly, detached, but surgical way, said, of course, that's, that research is actually about 10 years old, and it's been trumped by this and this and this. And of course you've heard of the work of so-and-so, so-and-so, that completely refutes that. The guy was stunned. 
And he recouped and said, well, but this, this such and such and such and such study. Satipati said, of course, but actually that study is often misunderstood and it's been greater enhanced by this and this. Certainly you've heard of the work of so-and-so, which proves A, B, C, D. And you watch the look on the professor's face. It's like he kicked a beehive, he poked a bear, he realized that he was in a fight that he was not going to win. And it went back and forth a couple times. The man said this, Sadhguru said, of course, that's what everyone says, but they're not accounting for this, this, and this. And the man, you know, recounted, well, what, well this and this and this. Sadhguru said, of course, that's what everybody says. That's the common misunderstanding. But what about this, and what about this, and what about that? And the guy, Sadhguru, if it had been a wrestling match, he mopped the floor with him. And the guy finally said, looked at his watch, it was theatrical. He didn't really have to go anywhere. He looked at, oh, oh, sorry. I have to go, but I'll be back. You know, we'll pick up this conversation, you know, and then I'll be back. We never saw that professor again. Sadaputta just chased him right out the door. So all glories to, to Sadaputta. He loved Prashadam. I mean, he was renounced. He was austere. But he, he could in, consume vast quantities of Prashadam. And he was thin. He was quite, whatever it is, I'm trying to the right word, but he was thin. He was, he was uh, wiry, <clears throat> as they used to say when I was growing up. So he was lean, but he took tons of prashadam. And so I remember I was thinking about it. Where does this prashadam go? And then Dravida Prabhu, who's a you know, wonderful devotee and lives here in San Diego, by Krishna's grace. So he and I were musing over this, and then Dravida came back to me, and he, he, somehow or other he'd come across something, that the brain of all the organs in the body, the brain burns up the most calories. And then it made sense to us. He's got that big brain churning at 90 miles an hour, or 180 miles an hour, and that's where all the calories are going. And they're all consumed by Sataputta's prodigious brain. I remember we had a, a Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's disappearance day, I think it was. And we had a fantastic feast. It was one of those feasts that, you know, everybody cooked and made their, you know, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's and Srila Prabhupada's favorite preparations. It was just a knockout 15 course feast. And you can tell a quality feast that after all the prasad has been served, there's still leftovers. Everybody's filled up to the neck. They're kind of leaning against the wall or listing to the left or listing to the right, can't quite get up. I was serving, and so I came around and said, said to Sadaputta, and I could see that he had that, you know, he'd consumed mass quantities of prashadam and was listing to the left. And I said, Sadaputta, what did you think of the feast? And he said in that wonderful academic clipped accent of his, he said, Prabhu, it was jai-worthy. So that became our new measure, the quality of a feast. It, it was worth one jai, two jais, and the Sunday said it was a three jai feast. So we, we got it from uh, Sadaputta Prabhu, a jai worthy feast. He was very serious about his sadhana. He was a serious devotee. I mean, he had a great sense of humor, he was humble, he was warm hearted, but he was a serious man. And he loved the morning program. He was always at Mangalartik, always chanting his rounds nicely at, at Guru Puja, at Bhagavatam. He was very serious about becoming Krishna conscious. You know, Kaladri told me, Kaladri Prabhu at the time was president of New Vrindavan. Dr. Richard, Dr. Richard was Sadaputta, gave up everything. I don't know where he was teaching, or was it Sunni Bingham, or Bingham, where he was. And he went to New Vrindavan and uh, became a farmer. And frankly, he was one of the worst farmers. The, the way New Vrindavan worked, and here's what I mean, uh, as far as just a working, you know, a working bee on the farm. Um, after breakfast, you know, they would line, the devotees would line up, and then different, whoever's in charge of different projects, they'd, you know, select different devotees to come help him. It's like a baseball team, you know, and Sadaputta was always selected one of the last ones. And because, you know, they didn't, know who, they didn't know that he had his PhD in statistics or whatever it was. They didn't know his, his history. So, uh, you know, Sadaputta, they'd have him digging fence holes like Judd Budd. He never complained. He was happy to do it, you know. So he's out there, but he'd, you know, take a scoop of dirt, throw it into the pile, but then he'd think about the trajectory and the physics of that, and, you know, and zing, he'd go off. He'd be coursing the universe. 
And whoever was in charge of the work deal would say, hey, hey, rich, rich, back to earth, rich to earth, back to earth, you know, <laughs> get back at it. Oh, okay, and he'd get back at it, you know. So Kaladri Prabhu, who was the president of Vrindavan at the time, told me there was that famous letter that Prabhupada sent out and all temple presidents were supposed to read it to the devotees and search it out. Was there anyone with, uh, you know, masters or PhDs in, in, in the hard sciences? Because Prabhupada was setting up the Bhaktivedanta Institute. So Kaladri's there in New Vrindavan, you know, they're all farmers and, you know, mud boots and, you know, and the, but he's got this letter to read it out at breakfast, Prashanam. He's thinking, right, you know, <laughs> some of these guys dropped out of kindergarten. So, but he's ready to go, right? He's ready to make his, um, because uh, he, he had to do it. He's the presence of order from Prabhupada. So he made this announcement. Is there anyone here with a, either a master's or a PhD in hard sciences? And Sadaputta raised his hand. He was the only one. Sadaputta raised his hand. And uh, Kaladi said, well, well, that explains it. That explains why, you know, he's the a square peg in a round hole. He said he's an academic. He's a thinker. So uh, all glories to uh, Sadaputta Prabhu. He used to give the oil. He gave a series of lectures, frankly, and I take credit for it. I said, you know, why don't you once a week or twice a week, I, th I forget what it was, Instead of the regular Bhagavatam class, why don't you systematically take your own time, elaborate as you like, and take the devotees through the Origins magazine, and uh, we'll record it. And I swear to you, any devotee, um, it should be mandatory that every devotee, because it's so much fun too, if we're out in the field, that Origins magazine is what's rattling around in the brains of the general public. It's w the way that the mediums and concepts by which they process the world. The mechanistic, reductionist, materialistic worldview. That's what Origins Magazine goes after. And Sadaputta gave class, I think it was twice a week, once a week, but he explained it so well. He was such a good teacher. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, a good teacher, they have to really understand the subject. They have to have realized the subject matter. And because they've completely understood it, they can present it for, to the layman in a way that the layman, on average, can understand it. So, like E equals MC squared, it's a very simple equation, E equals MC squared, but it unlocks the most powerful force in the universe that we found out so far, except for Brahmastras. But Sadaputta could explain it so nicely, so simply, so clearly, because he had deeply, deeply realized it. Sadaputta was ahead of his time. Um, and I remember him explaining to me, explaining in one of the classes, you know, the Darwinistic theory, you know, you just take enough chance, you throw the Darwinian dice enough times and you're going to get a mutation that's actually has an advantage and in this way by, you know, survival of the fittest and mutation, everything evolves. And it works at, you know, chemical evolution and into life, the whole thing, that the, from, from, you know, whatever it is, from the singularity, I think is what they say now, everything they, <laughs> who that guy says at MIT, the creation, or, they don't say creation, they say existence is the original free lunch. Everything came out of nothing. The same guy who said, uh, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. I remember Sadaputta saying, you know, that all of a sudden from one point, one singularity, intensely dense, uh, all of a sudden out of one point, poof, all creation comes. He said, why that point? There's so many points everywhere, so many, you know, why that one? And in addition with his statistics, he actually proved mathematically that you cannot throw, you know, you throw the dice enough times you're going to get a uh, double six. But if you take the interdependent complexity, symbiotic relationships, the sequen sequence and, and simultaneous occurrence that need to happen, some simultaneously, some sequentially, all interrelated, all interdependent, all beneficial. As soon as you have one that, that's, that's a, a mutation that causes a problem, then you've knocked it out of the cycle. They've got to be a series. Anyway, the existence, accepting their own numbers, has not, the, the existence that has not been around long enough for, for there to be enough times to throw the Darwinian dice 
to get the complex interdependent systems that create this world. The, you know, the existence, the world we live in, the cosmos. I mean, now they're coming to that point. I I'm, see a, a Hrina Nanamash just posted a, an article on this. But Sadaputta was, whatever it is, 40 years ahead of his time. So I've gone on long enough. I, I was just thinking, I wanted to close with just two short things. Sadaputta told me something. You know, I was the devil's advocate, comes to me naturally. And I was saying, you know, you expect us to believe all this mystic arts and, you know, the, the Bhagavatam and Narada Muni and all the, you know, you know and, and the demigods and the moon planet is a heavenly planet. I mean, you know, spare me. And of course, I was playing devil's advocate. And he gave a simple example that completely changed my world view and deepened my faith and conviction, not just faith, but my conviction in the words of Bhagavatam. He said, suppose we're going to meet on the corner of 5th and Main, downtown San Diego. It's, you know, it's a grid pattern, so on the intersection of 5th and Main. And we're going to meet on the southwest corner, and we're going to meet at 9 a.m. tomorrow. I mean, that's pretty specific. 9 a.m. tomorrow, southwest corner, 5th and Main. So, we meet the next day. I go down there. No Sadaputta. Hey, Sada, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, anyone who knows me, I'm not the most patient of people. So, I'm waiting, you know, 15, 20 minutes, half hour. This is before the cell phone days. Well, something must have happened. I, I forget. I go home. Next morning, I say, Sadaputta, hey, what happened? Where were you? Sadaputta says, I was there. The question is, where were you? So, how could both of us be in the exact same place, exact same time, both on the southwest corner, 5th and Main, but completely miss each other, and assuming sight and all that stuff, you know, that we've got good eyesight. Sadaputta said, if you look at it in two dimensions, you know, whatever that is, width and length, okay, we should have seen each other. As soon as you add the third dimension of height, okay, I'm on the ground floor, Sadaput is on the fifth floor. Two dimensions, we're in the same place. Three dimensions, we don't even see each other. And as the Bhagavatam and our great Acharya say repeatedly, and modern physics will say the same thing, you know, you add the dimension of time, you add so many different dimensions in there. I forget what Einstein said, there were so many dimensions. But the simple point is, if you present, if, if you accept the principle of multidimensional universe, then the whole thing opens up and becomes plausible. You, know, you can go to the moon in one dimension, like I can skim across the ocean, I won't see the fish, I won't do that, you know. But if you go down deep inside, if I, if I have a deep dive suit, if I'm properly, if, speak, if I'm a fish, you know, if I'm acclimatized, then I can see it. You have to fit to the climate and to the dimension. So as soon as Sadaputta, just convinced me. So I'll end with this. One of the profound things that impressed me about Sadaputta and we're one of the cornerstones of his approach to his studies, was if something's in the Bhagavatam, it's not, his job was not to question if it's true, to study, well, is it true or isn't it true? If it was in the Bhagavatam, he accepted, a priori, axiomatically, that it was truth. He accepted that. But his job was, he didn't, you know, it wasn't blind faith, he didn't shut off his intellect. His mission was to prove, to understand and then share with others how it was true. How, not if, it's in the Bhagavatam, it must be true, but how is it true? And he gave his life to that mission. So we can never repay Sadaputta. I'm so grateful that you're spending this time thinking about him. And uh, he's one of my heroes and one of our heroes. All glories to Sadaputta. Hey, um, Audrey Narayan Swami, he's a very good storyteller. I can appreciate especially the stories. I was also in the car with Sadaputta in New Jersey where the door became ajar. <laughs> and we talked about that for the whole hour of our trip. Um, I also want to uh, welcome uh, Damodar Swami. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Um, I, my 
point out some of our guests. We have a, a, a lot of special guests here. Um, at the Bhaktivedanta Institute, our business is to research and publish, to share thoughts. Sometimes they're complete thoughts. Sometimes they're, as Sadaputta would often do, pushing in a direction, which you'll see when we get to mechanistic and non-mechanistic science. Right now at the BI, we're working on several book projects. We have our Christina here is uh, working on our book on uh, consciousness with the Kandidi and Tamarpani. It's probably one of the most important books we can produce. And the original conference Prabhupada had us do in October 1977, Life Comes from Life. I had to reword it for uh, 2023. We would call it Consciousness Studies. Uh, the uh, famous uh, philosopher David Chalmers uh, opined, the hard problem of physics is consciousness. So that's what we'll be discussing in a little bit. Next, uh, I also want to, I think I made this point, but not, today is Sadaputa's birthday, and that's why we planned it for this weekend. Um, we are at the Sunday feast tomorrow. There'll be a very uh, short talk on Sadaputa, and the Bhaktivedanta Institute is sponsoring the feast in Alachua. So you are all cordially invited to Alachua for, I think, RT 415, lecture at 5. Um, and if you sit through the lecture, we'll feed you. 